Good morning, and welcome to the Amarillo Evangelical Baptist Mission. It, it's good to be here this morning. It's good to have everybody with us this morning uh, in any condition. <laughs> He's looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, back at you. But it's good to have you all here this morning. It's good to be able to get together like this and do this. Amen. And, uh, you know, if they ever try to stop us from publicly meeting, I'm still going to do it. So uh, hope you all will still continue to get together and oh, yeah. come out wherever, regardless of where we are. Uh, anyways, this morning we're about to jump into some uh, praise and worship music, uh, kind of our MO every week. Uh, in that moment, if you want to, you can sing with us uh, if you choose to. Uh, you can pray. You can use that as an opportunity to just draw closeness to God. Let God call you unto Him. And let that Holy Spirit fill you. Just kind of prepare your heart for the message. Um, if you're at work, I hope you don't get in trouble for listening with us, but we're, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, if you're in your kitchen cleaning or wherever you are in your house, you jump in, sing with us. Even if you're in your jammies, we don't, we don't care. We're just happy you're there. All right. Uh, then we're going to jump into our message. But before we do any of that, uh, I'm going to ask my brother, uh, Gary Ray, if you'll open us up in prayer this morning. Holy Father, I thank you, Father, for this wonderful morning for bringing us together. Father, this morning I pray for Brother Lindell, Father God, that, that the healing virtue of Jesus Christ would just reach out and touch him and that this blood pressure of his would come down in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, put strength in his body and touch, touch Judy. God, that you just bless that family abundantly. And bless the word today, Father God, and touch our hearts that we may understand what you're trying to say to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Also this morning, um, if I can pick this up, uh, Paul and Vanessa Cherry are at Emmanuel, uh, I guess is the name of the church in Burkeville. So if you're uh, watching that and you want to pray for them, that's where they are this morning. Uh, starting for, from today, it looks through, uh, looks through Tuesday, if I'm reading my calendar right in my mind. So anyways, be in prayer for them. And I may bring them up every week, just kind of have a, yeah. a mission to pray for, okay? Uh, so here we go. Oh, that's pretty. <laughs> Thank you. 
just tuning in, it's good to have you here this morning. All right, we're going to jump in right now uh, to some positive social media. That's what we call it, kind of in our, our getting together here. Um, okay, I really like this one. I saw this one, and I, I had to add it in there. And I don't know who put this one out there, but uh, I liked it a lot. It says, true story, God always works it out. I just panic first. Yeah, that's Anybody else in that boat? Yeah. I'm definitely in that boat. Like I said, sometimes I'm trying to figure it out before I've even consulted him with it. And it's just like, that's obviously not going to work. So, <laughs> it's good to know. I think Kathy sent me this one yesterday, right? It says, church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. Read that twice. Hospital for sinners. And uh, I like how, how in scripture it's referred to as the sick that need a doctor. Oh, I didn't even know I could do that, but I sure can. Huh? I started rolling the wheel and it started going wild on me. Okay, so thirdly, the devil lies well because he knows the truth well. You better know the truth well so you can discern the lie. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Amen. That's one of the reasons that the devil is so successful in lies and and deceit is because he does. And I hate to say this so so uh, bluntly, but a lot of the churches, so called churches, they manipulate the word of God. That's right. They try to manipulate it to fit uh, an agenda or or a time period or whatever, and and they try to change the word of God. And the devil kind of does the same thing. He knows the word probably better than most of us, but he's going to take you to try to manipulate and twist and pull different things out of it that is so far out of context it never did make sense. And so last but not least this morning, pain that brings you closer to God will always be better than comfort that keeps you away from him. Hard to believe sometimes when you're going through some trouble, um, you know, it's like, uh, find joy in all things, always, you know, rejoice. And you're not rejoicing in your sorrow and your trouble and your and your discomfort. You're 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 rejoicing in the fact that he's still God and he's still in you he's still in your life and your heart. He's still able to make change and, and that's not going to change. And so you're rejoicing because of who he is and where he is, you know. So good things to remember. So a couple of questions this morning to kind of get our wheels turning. I like I like when, when God presents me with questions sometimes. Uh, I don't like it when I when I don't find the answer right away because I won't find it, you know. But it kind of stays with me and I continue to look. Uh, first of which, according to Scripture, is it okay for us to get angry or, or be angry? Yeah. Is it okay to do that? Okay. <laughs> How many, how many people think it's okay to get angry, according to Scripture? It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Okay. A lot of it's going to boil down to what we do with it, right? Uh -huh. When you get angry, what do you do with it? Okay. Uh, and we're going to find out as you read that, that Jesus had been angry a time or two. Okay. Uh, secondly, how many times did Jesus need to clear the temple courts? If you don't know the answer to that, we'll cover it. All right, we'll cover it. But, um, you know, there for a while, I, 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 was mis I was mistaken in my answer of this, okay? And so further study changed, changed my answer to the truth, right? And then lastly, oh, I don't have a last one in this. So like I said, a couple. We're going to start reading today in John chapter 2, uh, verses 13 through 25. I'll give everybody a second to get there. All right. Verse 
verse 13 starts off. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Okay, so what was the issue? Well, the issue wasn't necessarily that uh, the doves and the, and the animals were being sold. The issue was that people were making a profit. They had turned it into more of a money-making place than a house of worship. That was the problem. Okay, money changers, um, from what I understand, uh, it's in the very top. There's cups in the top. Anyways, from what I understand, people were even exchanging types of currency. And so there was, there was a cost for the exchanging of currency. It wasn't dollar for dollar, okay? It was like, yeah, we can exchange that, but it's going to cost you this, right? And so there was money being made. And so when Jesus saw it, he was angry. He was angry. You're missing the point of what all this is for, and you've turned this into a complete mess. And he went in there, and as he's driving people out, um, I'm sure people are not wanting to get whipped. <laughs> so, so they're getting out of there. I like, I like too that some people would say, well, well, what did he do with the money? It says he it says he overturned the tables, and uh, I'm guessing the money just kind of hit the ground. He wasn't concerned with the money. That's not what it was about. It was about what people were turning the temple into that they had a problem with. And then it's, as he says right here, uh, they remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Meaning that Jesus is very passionate about the temple. Amen. So the question is, was he mad? Yes. I think it's safe to say he was pretty unhappy. Okay. Um, but he didn't come in there and start cussing at people. He didn't go in there like... Scarface and start shooting people, right? Uh, you know, good things to good things to understand. Uh, but he was obviously not happy. Verse eighteen says, "The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this?'" Now I'll tell you what. Um, back off for just a second. But think about that question being asked to Jesus. Obviously, they didn't understand who they were asking that question to. Can you imagine asking God? Why do you think that you have the authority to do anything? Yeah. I, I think the ground underneath your feet is about to be shaken. Okay? So that's kind of what I thought of when I read that. I was like, man, that, that took a lot, of, a lot of guts or a lot of stupid, okay, to go up and ask that question. Verse 19 says, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Okay, so normally when you hear something like that, you're going to get the human response before you get the spiritual response. Why? Because that's how our thinking works, right? When we usually when we're when we're presented with an earthly problem, we try to come up with an earthly solution. Usually before we start seeking that of a spiritual solution, and that's that's what happened here. You'll see in verse twenty, they replied, "It has taken forty six years to build this temple." And you are going to raise it in three days? You have to think about how crazy that sounds. It took us 46 years. Lots of people, lots of labor, lots of stone movement. And you're going to do it in three days? Ah, whatever, okay? But the temple he had spoken of was his body, okay? After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Much, much like this, us today is a lot of seeing is believing. Mm -hmm. But we need to be careful with that. We, we cannot be led by sight. We have to be led by faith. If we think that in the coming time that the Antichrist and all the things that follow are not going to be deceiving, we've got another thing coming. Okay? Deception will be all around us. And what we perceivably see with our eyes could manipulate our hearts to follow something that is not God. Yes, sir. And the word also says, blessed are you, the people who do not see but believe. 
We don't have to see to believe. We know God's there. We believe. Yes, thank you. And when He says something, believe what He says. Just, you just believe what He says because He said it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah it's, but that's that's harder to do than it, than it is to say. Man, everybody can just say, "Oh, you just gotta have faith." And yeah, faith is kind of hard to come by sometimes. I don't understand that anymore. What they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. Uh, I've been told to have faith, and I get mad. I get mad. I'm like, ah, oh, what do you know? And then later on, you're like, yeah, but he was right. <laughs> Man. And it just kind of it just kind of beats me up a little bit. But that's what we do. We have we have to have faith that in a lot of different things that he is who he says he is. Okay, that he is God. There's only one God. We have to have faith that he has one Son. And that one son was sent to the world to, to be crucified for us, that we that we could have our sins covered and have an opportunity to go to heaven. Without him, we're 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 damned in our sins. I mean, some somebody somebody asked a question on the radio the other day. I, I listened to that that praise and worship channel, right? And they asked a pastor a question. They said, What if Jesus had never been sent, never died for us? He said, Well, then we're all done. <laughs> There's no reason to even continue on the story because we were done before we started. And that's the truth of it. So there's faith in a lot of different things. And then there's faith in the fact that God knows what he's doing. Do y'all ever struggle? Because you don't know what he's doing. I struggle that way a lot of times. I have no idea what you're doing. But you're doing something. Sometimes I feel that way uh, in my job. Sometimes I feel that way in my my personal life. Sometimes I feel that way in different friendships and, and family relationships. And I, I don't know what he's doing, but I know he's doing something because if he wasn't, then I wouldn't be there. Yeah. Right? So uh, just faith in a lot of things. Faith that he knows what he's doing and that he has a plan. Verse 23 says, Now while he was in Jerusalem at the, at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Okay? Now, a lot of people struggle with this, but the reality is this. He knows more about us than we do. You say, well, how's that possible? I wake up, look, I say to myself, I wake up and look at this ugly face in the mirror every day. <laughs> I know myself better than anybody. And God says, well, not anybody. Not anybody. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, a lot of people don't like to hear something like this, but but, but uh, Jesus himself said, we're, we're in filthy rags. Mm -hmm. Not the new creature, but the old creature. Yeah. It's just filthy rags. <laughs> yeah. And then a lot of people don't want to hear that, but it's true. Yeah. Yeah, we, we need to hear. We, we need to understand that we all have sin in common and we need to understand why that's a problem because some people a lot of people will definitely they'll go into the comparison game yeah but i'm not as bad as this person yeah i'm at least i didn't do that at least i didn't do that i didn't say that you know and it's to jesus there's not like this elevation sense of sin you either have it which <coughs> is why we all have it i'll save you a lot of time or you don't have it and the only reason you wouldn't have it is if you prayed for forgiveness and he gave it to you. And then guess what? I hate to be brutally honest with you, but here in a few minutes, few hours, whatever the case may be, you're going to be right back at a place where you're asking for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Because we all fall short. We all make mistakes. We all think things we shouldn't. And, and the reality of it is that, you know, some people say when they're in trouble, oh, I'm in trouble, I really need God right now. And we need God all the time. You know, we fool ourselves into thinking when life is good that, that we can give God some vacation time. <laughs> Just kind of let him go cruise the Caribbean until we need him again. And the reality is that we need him all the time. If you will, turn with me to Matthew 21, verses 12 through 17. Everybody there? Starting in Matthew 21, verse 12. 
it says, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. There again, talking about those exorbitant rates in the sales, the exorbitant rates and the money exchanging, uh, it, it was a business to them, not a place of worship. Really, what it should have been to be honoring was, I don't think Jesus really had a problem with there being a cost. If it cost you something to, to come up with, to give to somebody else or to sell to somebody else, you making your money back, I don't think was the problem. It was the fact that, you know, I'm going to make some, I'm going to make some profit off of you, you know. Uh, had it cost five cents and you would have charged five cents, I think you'd have been good, right? Because you were doing it as a worship need. Not, not to put yourself out, but not to, not to become profitably rich at the same token. It, it was a one-for-one, one, right? That's what I would believe. But he's, but he's in there. So, so, so why are we reading this? Because this is, not, this is not another account of the first time. This is the second time. Yeah. And you know, if some some of these pre, uh, preachers that's uh, that's uh, getting themselves rich off of the congregation, mm -hmm. they need to read that scripture and see what it's really telling them right there. That that they do. Um, I can't tell a church what they should pay their pastor, but I can say that if your if your pastor has three jets. Yeah, I mean, if there, there, there is a place where it's, it's stupid. Yeah, there okay, is. and uh, you know, and I'll, I'll let that. I'm not going to throw a number because yeah. that's really not my place. But I will say that I would have God analyze your heart and give you some serious mm -hmm. uh, wisdom as to what that should be. And if it's like that, it's, it's obviously too much. You look at Luke 19, verse 45 through 48, and that's. Verse 48 is actually the end of Luke there. And then it's going to jump into chapter 20, and we're going to read verse 1 through 8. That's why it's stated like that. But we're going to jump over to Luke right quick. Luke 19, 45. <coughs> and it's going to say right here, When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. Okay, so this is actually a second a second eyewitness testimony. Okay, I saw a second story. Same story, though. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple. I got to thinking about this. Every day he was teaching at the temple. Could you imagine being alive during that time and you realize that Jesus himself is teaching at the temple? Mm -hmm. Guys, I don't even care what day I go, but I'm going. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going. Can you imagine... Think about the best, the best message you've ever heard, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that's, that's just changed you. Like your whole life was just changed in a chair, getting ready to leave that place. Think about the best message you've ever heard, and you're going to top it tenfold. I believe that Jesus shook people to their core. I mean, the truth has a way of doing that, but Jesus had a very, very good way of doing that. Okay. But the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find a way to do it because all the people hung on his words. After they listened to him speak, they were, in, in a sense, addicted to what he would say next. They wanted more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And I believe that truthfully, if we will dedicate ourselves to the reading of Scripture however long per day or however long every other day or whatever it is, I believe that we will become the same way. Uh, I know Gary, Gary and I have talked on a couple of different occasions where we get to reading and we don't want to stop reading. Like We just want to keep going. Like, what happens next? Yeah. <laughs> Who is involved? You know? And you just keep reading. It's, it's like, uh, in a sense, it's kind of like your favorite novel. You know, if you're going to keep, and, you know, who did it? <laughs> kind of thing, you know? Um, but, but it has that kind of power over us if we let it. So for, uh, chapter 20, verse 1 says, One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, just imagine that. Jesus is telling you the good news. The chief priests 
And the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Okay? I want you to picture this. They, they, they've got a reason to, to approach him, but they need so much help to do it. Nobody would dare go up and visit Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. So my question was this in my study. Why were they so scared of him? Right? So there, there's one of a couple of reasons that I believe that you're going to bring this group of people up with you to approach somebody. One, you're scared. Two, you're, you're trying to publicly, I don't know, maybe make somebody look bad. And so you like having this group with you because it draws attention to what's going on. I don't know, but I, I think this is more out of fear. This is more like, hey, if it's just me, you know, if he asks me a question or something happens, we, we can't really collaborate, come up with a clever answer. I'm going to be on the spot, and I'm going to have to answer the man. Yeah. What would I say if I don't know the answer? I'm going to look stupid. Right? Uh, the truth of the matter, fact, the truth of the matter is that the, the devil is behind all of it. And he don't want people to hear the truth. At all. Exactly. But he's the culprit behind all this stuff. He got it. He got into their hearts and their minds from the very beginning. Yeah, that's true. They had, they had Jesus with them, and they continued to refer to him as a prophet. Little did they know until it was already too late that he was not a prophet, he was the Messiah. Right? Verse 2 says, Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? Now, I just want you to think about for a second, like, oh. once you realize who this is and the question you just asked him, the fact that he didn't just poof you from existence, who are you? I mean, the, the, the audacity. Who gave you the authority to do this? Wow. I think, I think we need to stop here for a second and realize, I think somebody needs to say, thank you, Lord for being patient with us. Amen. Because, man alive, how many times have we presented him with similar audacity in our statements and thoughts? And whew, Thank you, Jesus. Verse 3, he replied, I will ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Okay. This is going to give us a lot of context behind why so many people needed to come, come, come basically rush Jesus for this question to be asked. Okay? Look here. Verse 5 says, They discussed it among themselves. They knew they were going to have to. When Jesus says something, you have to think about it. You can't just, you can't just come back with, Because I said so. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not going to work. The same thing is true about the judgment that we're all going to face. Jesus is not going to sit there and say, what did you do with the time that I gave you? And you're going to be like, oh. And he's going to be like, oh, okay, well, let's move on to question two. Uh-uh. No. We have not successfully answered question one. And you're not going anywhere until we do. All darkness comes to light. All of it. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we, if we say from heaven, he will ask, why didn't you believe him? And that's probably what he would have said. But check out the other side of this. But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. If John wasn't a prophet, then it would have been of human, of human origin, right? We'd have just done it to do it. It would have been like going to Applebee's. <laughs> but it was a little bit more significant than that, wasn't it? <coughs> so check out what they're going to do. Now, now they're presented with this conundrum. They have to figure out, how am I going to answer this question? Verse 7 says, so they answered, we don't know where it was from. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. <laughs> amen. amen and amen. You know how much they hated that answer? Ooh, they hated it. 
I bet they were gritting teeth, ready to spit nails, but there was nothing they could do about it. And he didn't say it hateful. He didn't say it condescending. He just said, if you, if you can't answer my question, I'm not going to answer you. And as jo uh, the Jeremiah study, study Bible notes, I, I couldn't help myself. I had to put these in there. It says the temple priests uh, were in the employ of the high priest and had their tables set up all over the courtyard. Okay. Jesus cleansed the temple money, the, the, the temple of the money, making schemes influenced by Annas. Although Annas ruled as high priest for only a few years, beginning in AD 6, he saw to it that a number of his close family members retained the job so they could continue to deceive the public. He may drive us away today, but we're coming back. He isn't going to stay there forever, right? Sure, he wins today. He flipped our tables and our chairs today. But we'll come back. And we'll just continue to steal money from people. That's what makes me so mad about today. It's, it's not so much the temple. Because yeah. the temple was the only <laughs> place. But that's how a lot of businesses run. Mm -hmm. They could make a decent profit and not rob people. Because obviously you've got to pay your, pay your employees. You've got to pay your costs of doing business. The gas for your work trucks. I mean, I get it. To a degree, I get it. But these people charge exorbitant rates because they want to get rich off of one job. Money yeah, money hungry. You know, um, a plumber that comes, that we, we had this experience in our house already. A plumber that fixes a leak in a pipe and charges $600 to do it. Oh, God. Okay? Listen, I'm not a plumber. That's why I called a plumber. But the plumber sure got what he came for, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Okay? And what can I do about it? Nothing. Right? So it's unfortunate, but that's how business is run. And that's exactly what these folks were doing in the, in the courtyards of the temple. They were, they were selling things, making money, you know? And people probably didn't come with their own doves or their own sheep and cattle. So they thought, well, we'll just get it when we get there. It'll be easier than trying to get this cow to come with us all the way across across town and get it over there for a sacrifice. Could have been an aroma sacrifice. It could have been a blood offering. Who knows what it was. But the people say, hey, there's a need here and we can fully take advantage of it. We can take advantage of people right here. And people said, I mean, they, they hear the price of something and they're, I mean, I guess, what else, what else can I do? And when Jesus found out the first time, he was not happy. Grabs, grabs cords and makes a whip and he drives everybody out of there. And then he comes back to find that it's happened again. And I hate to say this. A lot of people are saying, well, how outraging that must be. But yet we have churches in Amarillo, Texas that do that every Sunday. Yeah, that's true. I'm not just saying it's in Amarillo. It's everywhere. But that's that's not a church. That's that's a church that's turned itself into a business. Entertainment. Yeah, a marketplace. You know, to raise money for this thing or that thing, uh, instead of instead of asking God what to do with it outside of the church. You have to understand the church does have to pay their bills. Having the lights on does generate an electricity bill. Having the water running does generate a utility bill. There are things that they have to pay. And guess what? They still have to pay for insurance and property taxes and everything just like everybody else. But in, in, in excess of that, that's when you say, Lord, I pray that you would bless this to your will, not mine. Mm -hmm. Where do you want it to go now? And there are some salaries in the church, but that's, that doesn't mean there again that your pastor has to get rich off the church. That was never the idea. The pastor is a full-time uh, servant of God. But they have bills too. Their family has to eat too. So how do you find that balance? And that's something that a church has to pray for wisdom and discernment on, sit down and talk about, and then see what their budget allows. Right? We need to be very careful that we represent the church accurately and respectfully to God's word. 
If God's word doesn't say it, this is what I mean by this. If God's word does not say it, then we shouldn't believe it. If God's word does say it, that's exactly what we should believe. God did not take time to mince words. He didn't say, you know what, I'll let, I'll let the faith in Christianity be up to open interpretation. You decide. Didn't say that at all. We, we like to sometimes get into a place where we add into Scripture. We want to try to say what happened that isn't necessarily accounted for in the Word. And, and though talking about it, you say, you know what, man, I wonder what that was like. I don't think there's any harm in talking about what it might have been like. It's when we start preaching what it was like and the Word doesn't say that. That's where we get into trouble. How do you know that? And I'll say, you know what, I don't. I don't, I wasn't there. I, I do know that uh, if you read scripturally, it says that if, if all the accountings were given for all the signs that Jesus performed while he was here, there, there wouldn't be enough places to put the books right. to write the stories. So what we have in the way of performing signs is such a small piece. <laughs> but it's everything that we needed to know. The faith of somebody to reach out and touch his garment and be healed. The faith of a blind man to come out and beg for him in a crowd knowing that he might be passing by. You know what, you know what that takes? A lot of people in the crowd said, man, that takes stupidity. You're blind. You're out here in a place where you could get trampled to death. And you know what it really took at the end of the day was it took faith. I'm going to go do this because I believe there's a chance that he might see me, that he might hear me, and that he might heal me. And, and I'm not going to waste this opportunity to get that chance. And he did it. And Jesus saw that faith and healed him. Amen? I believe that if we have that kind of faith in our walk, that we will be healed and that our needs will be met. They, they will be met and probably exceeded in our walk. I believe that. I've seen that too often and not believe that. Um, and then we, we also need to be very cautious of the warning that's given to us because in a way, now today, we are teachers of the law. But we can't be teachers of the law the way that the folks before us were teachers of the law because they missed, they missed all of it. And now that we know the truth, we need to teach with that truth. Are you needing to go? Go ahead. Alec, you ready? It's time to go. Verse, verse 20 there, right there. I'm going to give you all that to look at later on if you want to. But it's uh, verse 45 through 47. Uh, and it talks about the teachers of the law and how they will be punished severely. And we're talking about the previous teachers of the law, right? For, for their selfishness, for their missing the whole point. How can you be teachers of the Word of God and know nothing about the Word of God? Right. So what they needed to do, is, as soon as they were presented by the, by the presence of Jesus, should have fallen on their knees and said, even if and it's about honesty, God knows their heart, but they should have said to God in their prayer, we're not sure who this is, but he claims to be yours. Lord, open our eyes that we might see who he is for real. But that's not what they did. They went off of what they thought. They went off of tradition. They went off of this, that, or the other, and they were lost. They were so lost, they didn't even know they were lost. They didn't even know they needed help. There's scripture, I think that Jeremiah said, Woe unto the uh, pastor who lead my people astray. You can also put teachers who lead my people astray. Absolutely. And, and I suggested we wasn't going to know what that woe is either. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very serious question right there. You need that. That's good stuff. And that's a warning. That's a warningful woe. That's, oh, yeah. like, that's not like, hey, I'm over here trying to get your attention, woe. That's like, hey, that's dangerous what you're playing. It's dangerous. Very. And I agree with Gary. We don't want to know what's on the other side of the world. That's, uh, that's the last Revelation says, if you take anything away from this book, I 
to you this book, God's going to ask you to read this written in this book. Yeah. Ooh, no way. Yeah, I wasn't a part of that either. Uh, so, was this whole thing about collecting taxes and that being the main issue for Jesus? I'm going to give you an opportunity to answer that for yourself. Luke 20, verses 20 through 26, and that says there in in uh, caps, you tell me. Okay. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. Y'all ever know somebody who pretended to be sincere? Try to get what they want, right? By lying to you. I'm in real need. And this is one of the reasons that we struggle with panhandling, right? Because there are real people that have real needs, and there are people that take advantage of the needs that people have, and they'll they'll take your money at a corner. And then they'll go get into their Lexus and drive away. Okay? Uh, so let me tell you something that's hard for us to understand and believe. It is not our job to decide who does and who does not need help. Because I believe that somebody who takes advantage of the poor and the needy in that way, God is already planning to deal with that. Okay? Uh, far more severely than we could even think in our minds. And that brings punishment that, like Gary said a minute ago, I want no part of. Okay. God tells us to calls us to give. If we have it, give it. Give it in abundance, and he'll continue to give it to you. So don't be afraid to give. And when you see that person drive off in the car or whatever the case may be, just say, Lord, I pray that you'd have mercy on them. Because the punishment is more severe than we could think of. It says, they hope to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the government. Okay? So they're trying to ask these leading questions, hoping that Jesus will trip on his words, that he will say something uh, that, that could be, um, you know, said in such a context that they say, well, uh, you know, but wait a second, but you said this before, you did that before. And so they're trying to catch him in his own words. It's one of the best ways to get somebody to stumble, by the way is to get them to stumble on something they had said previously or a way that they'll answer a question personally in, in, in the live presence of that person. Okay? So verse 21 says, So the spies question him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right, and, what can, uh, and that you uh, do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. <clears throat> Doesn't that sound like a build-up? Like, the reason that I'm asking you is because I believe that you will give me the truth the first time out of the gate. You have no reason to lie to me. You have no reason to mislead me or to misguide me. It, it sounds like I'm being sincere. Right? Verse 22 says, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And now the question could be asked today. Is it right for us to pay taxes every year? And in different states, there's different taxes on different things, right? Uh, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that the only two states that do not have state income tax are Texas and Florida. Okay? And that may have changed since the last time I looked. But that's what it used to be. All right? And then, and then because of that, like, Texas does some different taxes that a state income tax providing state does not. Okay? So there's different things that they do to kind of make up for it. And the question could always be asked, is it right for us to pay taxes? Y'all want to talk about some things that irritate people with taxes? How about tax title and license on a vehicle when you buy a vehicle brand new? The taxes have already been paid on that vehicle by the first owner. So how is it legal and how is it lawful to charge taxes, title, and license to the second owner of the vehicle? And you would say it's not. But guess what? We do it every day. What about property taxes on a property that you've paid off and you own? Who are you paying taxes to exactly? Yeah. Wouldn't it only make sense that you pay taxes to yourself? But that's not how it works, is it? Yeah. Because you never own it. It's never really yours. Which is okay if you understand from a spiritual sense that we are simply passing through. This is not our home. So in, in a sense, we're paying rent. 
Okay. All right. And that still doesn't take the, the financial sting out of that, but it helps. Verse 23 says, He saw through their duplicity and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription are on it? Okay. Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, Then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. What a perfect answer. Right? They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public, and astonished by his answer, <coughs> they became silent. How, how cool would that have been to see with your own eyes? These people that are obviously out to get him. I mean, they're starting to show up. At, at all of his events, they're starting to show up and trying to ask him different questions. This isn't the first time they questioned him. This is probably one of the last times they questioned him. Do you know why they didn't send one person to go ask the question? Is because they knew that that one person would feel like an idiot. And Jesus, there again, respectfully, truthfully, okay, did not have an agenda to get them in any way in his answer, but made them all look stupid with the truth. The truth is one of the hardest things to argue with, isn't it? Anybody in here ever been hurt by the truth? I have. Yeah. But you can't do anything about it because why? Because it's the truth. All you can do is kind of sit and stew in it until you're ready to try to make right with whoever or whatever that is. But they say that they say nothing hurts more than the truth. And he gave them the truth. And because they wanted to basically make a public uh, a public show of this, the show became them looking stupid in front of the people. You know, in today's day and time, you, you could you could hear the crowd behind them, ooh, got him, and, and who knows what it was like then. It could have been exactly the same. But it wasn't Jesus' intent to get them. It was Jesus' intent to answer the question truthfully. At the end of the day, when we say give to God what is God's, what is God's? Nothing. Everything. Everything is God's. Including the metal that was used to make the denarii. The denarii. Okay? Yeah. But but it was it was there again. The, the challenge was given to the people. It's up to you. What what belongs to Caesar? If you feel like it belongs to him, give it to him. But give to God what's God's. And what's God's is everything. That the people had to make that discernment for themselves. And that's why it was such a great answer. I'm going to call that answer perfect. Because to me that's exactly what it was. Or what it is. As we think about our service to God, do we give God what's God's? You know, we understand that it's okay to get mad. We understand that it's okay to get angry. And a lot of times, um, in that anger, I would just simply bring it to bring it before God in prayer. And you can even start off with, God, I am not happy right now. God already knows that. But tell him why. And there again, it's not because he needs to be told. But it's because of that closeness in that relationship. You would tell your best friend what happened to you today. Why would God be different? Tell God how you're feeling. Tell God what you said. Tell God what you did, even if it was wrong. Even if you know right now, without his conviction, that it was wrong. And let him speak to you. Let him give you a calm. Speak to your heart. And that conviction that he will give you, it's not all about getting whooped because he knew you were wrong. It's about becoming right because he's God. He has the ability to make all things right. Man, I don't always want to one-up somebody, but sometimes my heart does. Anybody in here ever wanted to get somebody back? I wanted to get somebody back once a bunch of times. But it isn't about that. Sometimes I just want to, I just, you know, I get I get to a place where I don't even know what caused the issue to begin with. Man, me and this other person were mad at each other. We got we got this 
this issue with each other, and I don't even know where it came from. At this point, it's so stupid, I really just like to squash it. You know? And if it was that easy, sometimes you just go up to the other person, you say, you know what? I don't even know where this started from. I'm sorry. I'd like to just move on. And sometimes that may work, but sometimes it may not. But I'll tell you what will work. And it works on his time, not yours. God, I really just want to put this behind me. I feel foolish that I'm even irritated by it. I don't know where it started. And that doesn't even matter. But I know where I'd like it to stop. Right here, right now. Please show me how. Teach me what to do. That I might do it. There is healing power and salvation power through Jesus. And he so badly wants to give it to us. But he's more concerned with giving it to us, it appears, than we are in taking it from him. And one day, time is going to draw out. And not over when. It could be this afternoon. It could be right now. But like I said before, I would not play with God and with time. Because when it draws out, it's going to be too late for us to be like, ha, I was just kidding. Give me another chance, God. I was just playing. I didn't even mean it when I said it. It was a joke. But right now, it's not a joke. And then, it will be even less funny than it is now. And now it's not funny. So make a choice. Make a choice as to whether you believe in God or you don't. But make sure that you can live with that choice. Because once you make it, you may be stuck with it. Right? Brother Weldon, will you close us in prayer this morning? Sorry. Heavenly Father, good to you. Thank you for the many blessings you give us. Lord, just help us to know right from wrong when to speak and when not to. Lord, just forgive us where we fail thee. Be with each and every one of us as we go our separate ways and come back again. All this we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Good to have y'all with us this morning. We hope we get to see you again real soon. Bye for now.